All right. Uh, we're welcome to everybody. This is the 98th meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Um, so for the topic today, um, Desiree Dressenar will be talking about business models from linear to circular to regenerative. But before we start, please um, join me in a moment of land acknowledgement. In Canada, it's customary for us to start events with the acknowledgement that compared to Indigenous populations, we are all newcomers here, whether our families have lived here for months or for a century. This is part of our truth and reconciliation process with our First Nations, the Indigenous people of Canada. This is sacred land on which each of us is privileged to be. This land, nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We are privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. We invite you to consider your relationship to the land and how you benefit from being there while the original, care original caretakers may not. Take a moment to reflect on, research, understand, honor and respect people's indigenous to the lands where you live, work and play. Remember that today, this place is increasingly home for, to peoples across the world, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be here wherever you are. I personally live in the traditional territories of the Nitsitapi and the people of Treaty 7 uh, region, including the Siksika, the Pukani, the Blood Tribe, Kainai, the Tsitsina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Our watershed is the Bow River Basin. If you know which watershed you're, you are in, would you mind just putting that in the chat? That would be great. It's nice for us to see um, where people are and how they're connecting themselves to the land. We make this recognition because biophysical environments vary in scale from microscopic to global in context. We can't help but be connected and interconnected to our place. We are dependent on factors in nature that have an influence on our survival, development, and evolution. As such, we depend on water at a cellular level. We depend on it for our livelihoods, healthy ecosystems, healthy people, and a robust economy. Just think about where the sewer in your building is connected to. I'm sure you get the washroom before this meeting, or maybe you're gonna go after. So consider the ecosystem services that, provide the, um, that are provided by the watershed you are in. We are a community of innovation practice and research, and in our focus is on the design of enterprises that are what we call fit for future. We consider enterprises fit for future as they follow and accomplish a normative process which we call flourishing. <clears throat> there are a lot of possibilities for you to activate within the network no matter if your focus is education, research and employment or something else. This is a network that you can enter in quite quickly. It's fun. Many people are open for collaboration and cooperation. There's a lot of knowledge and competencies and skills in this group. So hopefully you're in the right place and ready to engage in a global network of possibilities. We're calling it the flourishing enterprise movement. <clears throat> We're a tribe of 2,240, 2, um, up from 42 since last month. So we're growing between 30 and 40 and 50 uh, new members every month. So welcome if this is your first meeting. Let us know in the chat if this is your first meeting. Introduce yourselves. If you can introduce yourself with your name, your affiliation, and your location, it's very helpful for us to sort of pinpoint where people are coming from. So how did you find us? Some of you may have already been uh, participating in our past recordings on our uh, Google Drive or our YouTube channel. We have a LinkedIn channel, which is where most of you are coming from. And we also have a Facebook channel and a um, Twitter channel. The, the hashtags that we're trying to use are strongly sustainable, flourishing business, business model innovation, and sustainability as flourishing. So if you're ever working on some projects and you think this ties into us, please feel free to tag us and we'll be happy to share your information out. We would like to think that we're contributing to a growing and worldwide movement for flourishing enterprises. Our goal is to create impact at scale quickly, to create a world where enterprises excel because humans flourish and nature survives. The work is based on transdisciplinary science systems, indigenous knowledge, ethical and moral frameworks. We consider ourselves to not only be in sync with the UN SDGs, but even going beyond them. Some of the logos which you see here, um, consider, we consider them and hopefully they consider themselves to be a part of this movement. You might recognize them, so you might not. I invite you to look them up when you have a chance. They're all unique and very interesting and valuable contributing organizations. 
These are initiatives that the members of our group have formed in order to do good, to do well. So what this means is that members here come together and create initiatives that drive their desired impact. And it's really up to you to find a good way to do good to do well and motivate other members to join you in your um, quest to do that. So you might be interested in joining and participating or sharing some knowledge um, from or with each of these organizations. And hopefully all the members will be interested in finding out what you're doing, which is one of the reasons why Desiree is here today. <clears throat> and last but not least, we're also a collaboration hub for strong sustainability in the sense of scientific publications, book publications, conferences, and most notably, um, some of the international conferences that are coming up. I'm gonna pop some of those in the chat so you can have, oops, so you can have them handy. So here's some of the conferences that are listed on that screen. <clears throat> so if you have any knowledge about any of the conferences that aren't on this um, slide, please let us know. We're in the process of putting together a calendar and keeping track of these things. So every monthly meeting, if you come, you'll at least see some of the updates here when we get to this slide. So um, normally you've seen this slide if you've attended before, and it's usually me and um, um, Tim. <clears throat> for some reason I'm blacked out, but most of you know what I look like already, or you can just look in the top of the screen and you'll see me. So I'm just going to do some quick introductions. I'm not sure if they're in the room or not. So um, Amy Chambers, uh, she joined in March, and she comes with a background of 20 years experience in animating strategic communications uh, from in B2B and B2C uh, not-for-profit or uh, not-for-profit organizations in Europe and North America. Amy Morrell is a leader, problem solver, and design strategist. She brings over 20 years of experience in developing strong relationships and partnerships with clients, colleagues, and other stakeholders across many sectors, including retail, environmental tech, government, luxury apparel, fashion, higher education, etc. Justine has a multidisciplinary background in <clears throat> engineering and the arts. She is currently completing her master's degree in strategic foresight and innovation at OCAD University. Alejandra is an uh, industrial designer with experience in product innovation and a deep interest in trend research. She's passionate about environmental issues and is currently pursuing a master's degree in st strategic foresight and innovation at OCAD University. <clears throat> we also have a new pet person, likely, hopefully, potentially coming on uh, this week as well. So by, next, uh, by the next meeting, there might be another one or two people who are um, looking forward to um, making the animation and activities and engagement in the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group a little bit more robust than what Tim and I had been able to pull off on our own. Welcome to the new community animators. Uh, we'll be posting out their bios in the LinkedIn profile and the Google um, group uh, sh shortly after this meeting. <clears throat> All right, so here's where, why people are here. Um, in 2014, after a long career in, in uh, regular business management, Desiree decided to follow her heart and become an entrepreneur for the regeneration. Aligning the economy with ecology and the human spirit is definitely possible. Synergy, business model design, and radical innovation, including ecosystem functions, will change the economy as we know it. She works with governments, entrepreneurs, scientists, on widespread solutions for world problems. Healthy living soil, healthy technology, and restored water cycles make her happy. Especially when the local community members earn a good living, local economies are strengthened, and the global inspiration flows freely, co-creating the future. One of her assignments is being uh, an external blue co economy expert for the European Commission. Her projects are in the private sector, public sector, and education. She shares her knowledge um, open source via Medium and other social media. She works locally in the Netherlands, in Europe, and worldwide. So take it away, Desiree. Thank you, Laurie. Have thank I stopped you. sharing? Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited with this group because... I said it to Laurie before, there's a lot happening in sustainability, but sometimes it's just not radical enough. We really need to combine um, business and governing and whatever with the planet and the people, and otherwise it will never work. So we need to really create different systems. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm excited to be here. I see all kinds of people in the chat uh, from all kinds of areas. Some of them are known to me. Some of them are known to the strongly sustainable business model group. 
So I really hope I can share something valuable for you today. Um, Laurie asked me, because of an article that you read from me in, um, uh, in Medium, I've been writing for two years on Medium now, sharing all kinds of insights. And um, yeah, the, the article was called From Linear to Circular to Systemic Business Models because I think it's really very important that we understand this and that we are going to apply it to all kinds of businesses. So um, let me start with some details. What am I going to tell you today? First of all, I want to be zooming out a little and see the full picture together with you. We're going to have a look at a bit of science, economy and society and see what's happening there. And we're going to talk about silos and breaking down walls because that's very important if you want to find the solutions. Then we will zoom in again and really see about the business models and what it means for business models. And of course, it all starts with leadership. Um, by now, I think most of science is very clear about the fact that the Earth is a self-regulating complex system. And there are some keywords with that. It is systemic. It, uh, nature is always a, works with abundance. It's also symbiotic. Um, there's a lot working with flow and it always optimizes. And if we look at what we do with our human systems, our man-made concepts, then the keywords are completely different. They are linear. There's always based on scarcity. Only scarce things have value in our man-made systems. There's always polarization. And we always try to maximize one thing because we only see this one thing and have a very short-term vision and say, okay, let's maximize this and then this is a solution. Well, the world doesn't work like that. So that's what I want to explain as well. And I always try to explain it with this little picture. Um, on the one hand, there is this big world. That's really, um, if you zoom out, you really, see the vastness of it. And it is our planet, it is even the universe. It is vast. It has lots of countries in it on the planet and lots of cultures, lots of different ways of doing things. And then there is this smallest element and that's a dot. And the smallest element is always unique. So we have unique atoms that build unique organisms like our bodies. And then those unique organisms build other organisms like a, a, a business or a, a country or an economy or all these organisms work together. And if you see how it works out, it's kind of like this, it gets chaotic. There's lots of, feedback loops in there and lots of, well, difficult stuff. And, and this is how the systemic thinkers normally want to explain it. Like, yes, it is chaotic and there's so many feedback loops. And then there are people trying to really make sense of this with AI and things like that, but they're always getting stuck in the past and what happened then. And then you see that there are elements which I find very interesting. And those are the, um, the, um, the hurricanes, for instance, they make space. They are like catalysts. And these catalysts are very important in a, in a system, in a systemic view, because yes, they do destroy parts, but it's more about making space for new things to emerge. The science behind all this is really, yeah, maybe when they um, started their science, they were not that believed. But at this moment, a lot of it has been proven and a lot of it is recognized in science and in 
um, yeah, in, in all the sciences, it's deep ecology, Arnanas. It's a man, a human is part of the ecosystems. It's not like, like we stand above it and can only rule over it. We are really part of it. We influence it in bad ways or in good ways. And we always have a role. It's not like nature can exist without us or we can exist without nature. Then we have the Gaia hypothesis, James Lovelock. It's a lot of the systemic thinking is based on his, um, his Gaia hypothesis that's saying that it is, that the planet is a self-regulating system. Then my personal favorite is Lynn Margulis. Lynn Margulis really uh, did a lot of work on symbiotic earth and the five kingdoms of nature. And you can see how these atoms go through the system, go through the planet and how it all works. And if you understand that, then you see that it's not about polarization, but it's more about symbiosis. Symbiosis is a much more interesting process than, um, than polarization is. And she was really very, very fierce about the fact that she said, well, um, um, Darwin was right, but uh, the, the neo-Darwinists just said it was about the genes. And the genes are just, they're stores of past information. The cells are the really interesting ones because they can regenerate, they can create. And then it becomes interesting because in an evolution, you have to create to become on a higher level which is what makes it interesting. And then um, lately I've been studying a lot about rhizomes and transversality. Uh, Gilles Deleuze is a, um, a philosopher and he did a lot of work uh, based on rhizomes and rhizomes are the roots, the horizontal roots of for instance, bamboos and grasses and when a part of the root gets cut off, it still has all the nutrients in it. And then it can sprout in an, in an unexpected place again when the circumstances are right, which is a very interesting thing as well to see about concepts, but also about very physical things like grasses and bamboos. And transversality is also has a lot to do with if you have no hierarchy, but really two people talking together and then a field exists in which new ideas come and then you create new things together. Felix Guttari did a lot of work on that and he's a psychoanalysis. And, and I think the time is right for these kind of philosophies to really grab root and also see what we can create with it in very practical businesses, governments, uh, human systems in general. So how do I do it? I never use AI. I must say I do work with some people who do use it. I work with some technology people who really do a lot of AI and put a heart to it and the future to it to really get it going, to make sure we make the right decisions, to get the right we always call it the acupuncture points of change, but I normally do it more easily. I'm just a freelancer and I go with my, my gut feeling, my intuition. I zoom out a lot and I just see all the connections and then I come back to my own route again and make my next step, my personal next step from this dot of the person I am. So that is how I find my personal route and always in collaboration with others. And then, yeah, my motto has become let's align economy with ecology and the human spirit because I think that's what needs to be done. If we cannot do that, we cannot live on this planet. And I also must say, I really love it that a lot of work is been going on at this moment. So I want to take you with how we organize our human systems now. 
we have the sciences and the universities, we have the societies and the governments, and then we have the economy and the businesses, and there are silos. And if we look at it, how it all works, they have one compass, and that's money. Because this money thing gets all the connections between them. And that's also what makes it flawed. So we all have roles. And also these three elements in our human systems have roles. So the sciences have the role of inventing and researching and proving and quantifying. And the economy and businesses, we've given a role of taking risks and creating value, creating jobs, maximizing profit. And then the societies and governments have the role of uh, subsidies, cleaning up the mess, and also having, yeah, creating public services. And as you can see, it's just a bit off because we have made a system where because the money is the compass, we say only gross domestic product uh, counts. And if you have a linear business model with limited responsibility, then the economy grows when we pollute. We made the system like that because a company can create uh, a product and they don't have to design their waste or their pollution or their resources or whatever, because we said, no, the government will clean up the mess. So the government creates jobs with cleaning up the mess. And that's why economies, if they just go on money, will always pollute more. And even jobs are created when we are sick. It's really, it's, it's not, not, yeah, it's stupid, but it is true because we have made these toxic triggers. And we cannot blame everybody for going with these triggers because we made it in our systems. And that's where we have to do things different. And if we then look at how a compass can be, a compass can be life. A compass can be evolution for all humans and all species. And if we take that as a compass, things would be completely different because we create different systems. If we then look at the same silos, we see what we need to do. And that is we need to optimize instead of maximize one thing. And if we optimize, then again, we do different things. We're going to think in systemic thinking and see all the connections and then make decisions, not just on one part that needs to be optimized, but on all these things that are there in a region somewhere local where you have uh, connections to local ecosystems and connections to local cultures. And if we then look at what is already happening and how it could be different, then the sciences and the universities, for instance, could break down walls within their institutions and say, okay, can the better sciences learn something from social sciences? Yes, they can very much because it's all based on this life. We have only one truth and that's the fact that we have natural laws. And maybe we don't understand them all that well yet, but we do know that if we take these laws seriously, we will really understand things and create different ways. We can really start having sciences not only based on quantity, but also make quality count because we can try to quantify everything. But if quality, life, you cannot quantify life what is quantifying life there is always quality in there it's like beauty how do you quantify beauty it's a quality but it's an important quality because we 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 feel inspired by it and then we can create again so we can also start with a chaotic reality like 
the old scientists did, like um, um, Goethe, for instance, or um, Da Vinci, they started much more from the chaotic reality. And then they said with their intuition, okay, how can we prove this or that? Or how can we really learn by observing? And then observation is a very important skill in the sciences. And then you get the fact that at this moment, the sciences are very um, reliant on the businesses to finance them. So why not have the patents only by the sciences and the universities and make them available open source to everybody and then the businesses who want to create with a patent pay maybe a percentage so that they uh, it's also available for smaller businesses and then the businesses get very uh, triggered to make combinatorial innovations to make with one patent, create different businesses on intersections, unique intersections, and they all have their own niches. And then you can make really great businesses also, and you can finance science and not be like too reliant on each other or too reliant on one company financing one piece of, of science. And the good things I've been, um, I've been observing in, in the world already happening. One of them is in this audience, Johan Gilles. We talk a lot lately about mathematics and the new mathematics and the super formula and the Gilles transformations. And what I love about it is that it brings technology beyond zeros and ones and it brings flow to technology. It brings emergence. And that is also, and he can really quantify it, which is very interesting for technology as well. A lot has been created already with it, but a lot more is possible. Then you also see it in the think tank, ZERI, the Zero Emission Research Initiatives. Gunter Pauli was one of my teachers in the beginning when I started out this, this whole search of mine of how it can be done. And there's a lot of work done there on new business models and technologies. Then there's, of course, biomimicry, who's doing a lot of technology as well. I love the, the research where they say that human systems, human technology uses mainly um, energy and material to create something new. The boost of energy, just created energy is needed and material. But if you look at how nature does it, then it becomes interesting. And then you go not with a new material, but you go with a structure to create a functionality, to create strength of a material or flexibility, or, and then it becomes very interesting. And the second one is even more interesting because the second one is information. And then if you're going to create with structure and information. There is information in all the space around us. And that's also what the super formula says. It's used for antennas because everything is an antenna. A flower is an antenna and a human being is an antenna and whatever, because there's so much information in here. And nature creates with it, which is interesting, which is what biomimicry does a lot of great work on. I can see it in the economy and systems view of life of Fritjof Capra, who's been one of my teachers as well. Or what we see in Amsterdam, they have now been using the donut economy models of Kate Raworth, which is very interesting stuff. If you look at, uh, at the outside, you have the planetary boundaries. And on the inside, you have the human basic needs as in the global goals. And then you can create in between those boundaries and which gives very different ways of looking at things. And the city of Amsterdam is using this actively to really change their governance and, and their business models and whatever. And a lot of cities are looking at that and saying, oh, maybe I can use that too. There's also done a lot of work on 
by Mariana Matsukatu, who, who also says a lot of what I just say, this GDP stuff is flawed. We need to do it different. And she works a lot with commons and uh, different models of ownership. But if you look at societies and governments, you also see that public money should stay public. Because at this moment, you see it really clearly, for instance, with the vaccines that have been created. There's a lot of public money going in there in the research. And then there's a few companies who make the vaccines and they turn it, alchemize it immediately into private money. And we allow them to do that, which is not what it should be done. So also there is a lot of work going on to see how can we make public money stay public? Can we work with maybe threefold ownership? Um, um, there's, there's lots of work going on here as well in regenerative farming, for instance. How do we use the land and who owns the land? Can the land be owned by the earth and a regenerative farmer and the community? That could be interesting. But how will it then work if a government wants to put a dike on a land, um, then you have to negotiate. And that's also interesting to do. So a lot of these things are emerging at this moment. You see, for instance, in New Zealand, where they have a much broader dashboard than just GDP. And there they're trying to invent this as well. You see really governments who try to make a longer term vision and also businesses who really try to make this longer term vision work and then do what I do, zoom out to the longer term vision and then say, okay, if I see all this, what will be my next step today? Because that's important too. And you just make this breathing move, movement all the time and you come up with your solutions. There's things going on about citizens assemblies and some of them really come up with great solutions for big problems like climate change, where governments cannot find the solutions. And citizens' assemblies, they really are doing great work at this moment. There's things going on in laws where there's rights for rivers and for mountains and things like that, which is interesting as well. Um, and of course, in the communication, and, and that's also my area a lot. So I think about that a lot, how to do it non-manipulative, how to always be aware of framing, even if you don't say something, because then you don't say it and that's framing as well. How to get it connected to long-term visions and how to get the solutions then adapted to target groups as well, because sometimes people get lost in long-term visions and too broad horizons. And then the businesses, the economies and the businesses, they can really focus on basic needs. They can make it local in the physical sphere and have a good economy. They can create niches with unique intersections and then do not have to compete so hard and really go on price all the time, but have their unique intersection, have their niche markets and be flexible again. And they can buy their patterns from science then and do their own combinatorial innovation. If we then look at the old paradigm, we see that it has been based on scarcity, but we have to make sure it is based on abundance. And if we go for abundance, we have to restore ecosystems first. We have to make sure that the planet can do what the planet can do so that we can be on this planet with so many people and still have a good living in all kinds of cultures and all kinds of ways in local ecosystems. We, can have to, we have to go from linear models to systemic models. We have to go from maximization of profit to optimization of multiple values. And we have to go from economies of scale to economies of scope. We have to combine things. 
Manipulative marketing will have to go to inspiration and flow and not try to hold your customer, but make sure that he can flow again. Maybe he's inspired with you today, but tomorrow he needs something else. Well, let, let this customer go. Why not? There's others, there's flow. You have to constantly innovate to do what you do. And then instead of globally and shipping around, you can have local vibrant interaction. Instead of competition, you can have niche. I already mentioned it. And instead of uniformity and having the McDonald's have the same burger everywhere in the world, let's go for diversity, please. The world is becoming so boring with all this uniformity. And then, the business models have to be value-based. Entrepreneurs should have their own values and always think with their hearts and say, what is my value? Let's put it in the business model. Have a strong why. Why are you on this earth as a business? Combine your head, your heart, and your gut feeling and make your business model like the flourishing business model canvas does so beautifully because then you intertwine everything and really come up with new solutions. This is what a linear business model does nowadays. We have a raw material, we do some production, there's already waste, there's consumption, there's already waste, and in the end, everything is waste. You could also see it as an iceberg. Our businesses make intentionally created value and maximize profit with that, but there's lots of unintended consequences. And these unintended consequences should be faced by a business. But then the good news is if you face that and really design everything in your system, you can have lots of flows in your business and also money flows. That's not the problem, but you have to think abundance. Look at what's all around you and then start creating with that in collaboration with others, making systemic models. Of course, this is a, a I, I don't speak for a group who's never seen this picture, I think, but this is uh, the circular economy. The good thing, what I like about it is that it, it really talks about added value to keep the added value in it. But the things I don't like about it is that it talks here about minimizing systemic leakages, and negative externalities. It's not about minimizing. It's really about not having them. And also I think, yes, we need to clean up a lot at the right side of the, uh, the butterfly, but the left side of the butterfly is where it happens. We have to create materials that are biodegradable in soil, fresh water, uh, salt water, air even, because otherwise we will not make it livable on this planet. And we can, it's not about not being able to do it. I will make, I will give you examples later on in the presentation. So um, this is what my friends in the Politecnico of Torino uh, um, are giving it a, um, an image, the linear production model on the left. And on the right, you see the collaboration between subjects and you see the systemic, the systemic business models emerging. There are businesses in between, there are entrepreneurial people. There are people like me, just a freelancer making my money in one way and also making a life and combining all these things together. There's um, always a focus on basic needs because that's really what we should focus on. It's no use focusing on anything else if there's so much lack of basic needs in the world still. So yeah, we can do it. In a linear model, we ship around the world. 
In a regenerative model, we adapt everything to local ecosystems and local cultures. In a linear model, we maximize profit. In a regenerative model, we always optimize multiple value. In a linear model, we use scarce resources. In a regenerative model, we use local, abundantly grown resources. So that are, for instance, um, you have a lot of crops that can grow abundantly. It's like bamboo, they're grasses. You can, you can harvest them several times a year. You can have other grasses like miscanthus. A lot is created with that at this moment, miscanthus. There's a lot created with industrial hemp. There's a lot created with algae, seaweeds. Um, all these crops can be um, grown abundantly. We can really grow biodiversity with it, which is very important because we need to have biodiversity. And we can use them like for textiles, for instance, why not? There's enough um, research now going on and there is a lot that can be done with other crops than just um, yeah, just the, the cotton that needs so much water or there's lots of other things you can do if you get creative. Um, in a linear model, you have a lot of competition and you work in, yeah, in, if we look at, at other ways in our business model creation, you work with uh, blue ocean models in the regenerative models and you work with the red ocean models where there's just this, this ocean of competitors who all go for price because they don't know anything else. They have to go with scale. Um, and here in the regenerative models, you find your unique intersection. Um, in a linear model, we have narrow missions. We have narrow goals. In a regenerative model, we always have a zoomed out why I call it. You have a why, why your business exists. And if you, for instance, look at, I don't know, if you say I am a car production company, then it's very narrow, you make cars. But if you say I'm in transportation mobility, then it gets interesting because you become so much more flexible. Maybe today you make cars, it's okay. You make cars today, but then if you're going to look systemically and say, what do cities, for instance, need? They don't need cars. They don't even need electric cars. I'm sorry, but there are so many people out there. We need different systems there. But maybe a car in the countryside is still a good idea. I don't know. But we have to look at that from a mobility perspective. And then car companies can become the mobility creators of the future if they start to get creative, have different streams next to their car creating uh, production models, and then say, okay, what do I already know about mobility that can be used in cities to do it differently? In a linear model, we finance a lot with debt. In a regenerative model, we finance a lot with stranded assets. There's a lot of assets that are stranded. They are like, I don't know, they are like buildings that are empty or they are like, um, uh, yes, sick people. There's lots of things like sick talents. People have talents, that's an asset. And if people are sick, then they cannot use their talents. So it is a stranded asset. Well, who has this problem? It's not only the individual. There are other people paying for that, like insurance companies and things like that. You can finance things with where the pain is. Really go creative there and make sure you use that pain for also the companies that might invest in your solutions to, to have solutions in a systemic way. In a linear model, we're blind for consequences. And in a regenerative model, we design with all consequences. We look at the whole um, iceberg. 
in a linear model, consumption is central. And in a regenerative model, there's always creation central. We are all creative beings. We are all entrepreneurial spirits. If you really find your, your passion, your vibe, in a linear model, technology is often a band-aid. We often look at downstream solutions. We create a problem first, and then we say, oh, let's fix that problem. And then some technology comes up and we fix a problem. Well, that's never a solution. We have to look upstream. And then technology in a design and with a heart, technology needs to have a heart. We need to look at it with this life compass and then technology can be really uh, good and, and great. And then in a linear model, we have a lot of technological lock-ins and that's a big problem. At this moment, like all our energy creation is technological lock-in. Um, and um, there are so many lock-ins that we are in and there are so many vested interests that people are trying to defend and that's where all the money goes and what i would love is that impact investors are also understanding this and really going in the regenerative models because then they understand that the money needs to go somewhere else in this whole system and the businesses have to do constant innovation and be flexible because life is going fast. The technology changes now are really going fast. So if you're not flexible, you have a problem. Then it's also good to see that we have ecosystem functions. This illustration is made by the World Wildlife Fund and they call it ecosystem services, but I don't like that so much because then you're going to put money onto everything. That's not how we should be doing it. But they are the ecosystem functions that you can still integrate in your business model. You can create a product and make sure you have enough fresh water created even. You can create healthy air inside buildings, for instance, if you create healthy buildings. But then you have to look in a systemic way to building a building. Because what else is a building than a healthy shelter for people to be temporarily in? Well, that's if we look at it like that from a life compass, you're going to create healthy buildings. Um, well, there's a lot of these things that you can use in your business model, because if you are not only looking at creating money, you will create different values. And then you will create ecosystem functions together with your products. And sometimes they are your products. And sometimes they are just created for the sake of creating them because you just do. Let's get to some examples. I've done enough explaining now. I hope some of this lands. Um, I must say, I haven't looked at the, I hope, Laurie, you have looked at the, at the chat. I don't know if there are many chat questions already at this moment. Okay. Then we go on with some examples. At this moment, the best examples are sprouting up where human systems and natural systems are interlinking as the most clearly, and that is food. Food is of course created on land, and you see a lot of these regenerative models created in the food systems. So there's regenerative farming going on, and it has different, it has different ways of doing things, but they all look at having healthy soil, restoring the soil and having food. Then there are short chains, the short supply chains. There are projects on land trusts where the land will not be only owned by 
um, some companies, but also, yeah, maybe by the community and then really create the food for the community with the farmers and having all these land trusts together. There's also intermediate projects, uh, products created like insects. Insects are a very good example of um, where you create from a waste stream, you have a waste stream created from the regenerative farming. And then on this waste stream, you can create insects before the rest of the waste stream goes to the soil again. So you and feed the soil and you create an extra value because the insects can be a protein source. Uh, the same you see with mushroom farming. You see a lot of the mushroom farming now, the biological ones going on, like oyster mushrooms on coffee waste is a good example. The coffee waste is taken from the cities um, and then there's uh, mushrooms grown on them before the coffee waste is again, the substrate of the mushrooms is again used to regenerate soil. So you have intermediate project products to create extra value in your business models before you feed the soil again. There's educational projects going on and business models about that. There's art going on and business models about that. There's food forestry and permaculture going on. Um, and the food forests might be a very interesting one as well, where you see a whole ecosystem created on a small piece of land because you work in seven layers of different plants and trees and, and uh, roots and whatever is edible or functional. It's not only edible, it can be functional as well. There's lots going on in the algae and seaweed world where you see that seaweed can be created and really restore oceans. Uh, you see the 3D sea farming going on where there's seaweeds and um, there's sponge and there's um, uh, mussels and, and uh, fish and everything for biodiversity. And then also having food for people in that way. And there's also a lot going on in the microorganism world. Um, I work in projects, for instance, in Holland, where we do bokashi on a real large scale with farmers to get all these uh, microorganism um, organic material back into the soils. And I also see projects like in Italy, where they do a lot of biochar projects where the biochar is used to keep the microorganisms alive for longer. So they create terra preta with it, for instance, as a very fertile soil as it, um, yeah, they're not sure if it is naturally or man-made in the Amazon, but it's very fertile and you can make it. It's, it's easily done. So there are projects about that. Then you also see here, this is also again a picture from, from Italy, where there's lots of pig farming going on for the Italian um, yeah, hams. And, and, um, and there you see that where you do it really economy of scale, it has a completely different impact than if you have much less pigs in a farm but you have a regenerative model where you have lots of other values created you see that the investment capital here is much bigger in the economies of scale than in the regenerative model and also even uh, here the annual uh, profits are bigger in the regenerative model the only thing why um, the entrepreneurs find it so difficult. They are so used to having this one focus. And this, this, so you have to either do it in one company or you have to collaborate with others. 
and collaboration they sometimes find very hard. Also, the fact is that this will turn into a toxic model if you don't put a heart into your pig business. Because even pigs, they are animals, they live on this planet, they have a passion for instance for digging and they need to dig so you cannot keep them in a way that they cannot have their talents done so you need to put a heart in there to really see how to make this work but i still want to put this this um, example out there as well because it's not only about going vegan or it's not only about um, doing things less it's also about really finding our our compassionate way of human being to live on this planet and create what we create in my areas you see a lot of the regenerative farming is going on there's hereburu for instance they have this model where they um, ask the community to put in 2000 euro to be uh, owner of the farm. They have 50 um, um, uh, citizens, families, and they have a monthly contribution and they make their own, they're together owner of the farm and they hire a farmer, a regenerative farmer to do it all, to do the work. And then they work together with the farmer to really make it work. And it's really, this business model is growing fast now in Holland. And then you see the community supported agriculture a lot. People's farm is in my area. They put it all in crates. They are just on uh, vegetables. Hereburo also has animals, but a people's farm is just on vegetables. And they have people in membership models. So that's business models with memberships. Also here, the community supported agricultures have membership models, local models to make it work and to have people have healthy food. Then you see that a lot of the island economies are at this moment reinventing themselves. And at this moment, I'm on Ibiza and I really see that here, the discussion is very big also because of COVID because this island has normally thousands, some thousands of, of inhabitants. And then in the summer, they have 7 million people on the island just because they are tourists. And that's where the economy is thriving on. Well, it creates a lot of problems. And also now with COVID, they're not coming. So that creates a lot of problems in economic sense. And that means that the islands really have to reinvent themselves. And that's good because islands have clear boundaries. It's easier for them to really see the ecosystem, where it is starting and where it is ending. And then you can reinvent. And I've been on the island in Spain where it has already this economy for 25 years, El Hierro. And they have reinvented their their systems to be really regenerative on energy, on food, on the sea replenishing, the, even the fisheries, the everything there. I've written some articles about it and it's really fascinating to see how they did it. And I really hope that Ibiza also uh, is inspired by it and finds their own models. Because if you have a very active self-sustaining economy based on basic needs, then you can restore ecosystems and have regenerative tourism. You can invite your caring tourists who are going to contribute to your ecosystem. And you do not have to just go for the big mass tourism that only pollutes your island. Then I see a really good group in Maine, in, in uh, America, Kimberly Samaha and there's this basis of, um, uh, they have this energy plant, which is the basis, and it's really going around that. They're really looking at what wants to be created here, and they're trying to create this, this local hub-based ecosystem. 
it's a very interesting process and they invite a lot of people in also to think with them so if you ever um yeah have the possibility to to do one of their zooms or something it's really interesting they're not only in maine um kimberly is also working in uh lebanon also with a lot of students and businesses and governments and so it's very interesting to see what's what's happening there in rotterdam in in holland we see that a whole hub has been created in a stranded asset it's really a very nice story these people they started out with the model that i mentioned to you um, the oyster mushrooms on coffee waste in the city of Rotterdam. And the two guys who started this company, Rotterdam, they, um, they did some legal squatting with their company in a, an empty building at the edge of the city. And the empty building is an old tropical swimming pool and they never got any new ideas for it apart from just doing apartment blocks and then the government didn't want that so it was empty and they started there and then after a few years of entrepreneurship and trying to make it work other entrepreneurs came all the time and and now the whole hub is like 50 entrepreneurships it is a bio lab there's food there's beer there's spirulina there's vegan leather there's architecture because they have found an impact investor who bought the building and now they're really creating, they're redesigning it with existing materials. They do a lot of education in there. There's a cafe and restaurant in there. It's a very fascinating ecosystem at the edge of the city of Rotterdam. Very inspiring example. But we also have like bigger standalone while standalone, they do really work with their um, with their communities and with their their uh, supply chains. But Nova Mont is a very good example. They started out in I think 2011 or something, and they were all created with a stranded asset money because this. Um, um this plant was closed down on sardinia italy and the government asked them if you're going to close it down you have to pay so much money because all these people become jobless and they got a bill of i don't know how much from the italian government and in the end they said okay there was this company, Nova Mont, and they wanted to start a biolab there. And they are really, really creating the biochemicals and the bioplastics and the biomaterials of the future. And it is based on a local, um, abundantly growing crop, which is a thistle. And with this thistle and everything that's in there, they create biodegradable materials that are biodegradable in soil, in fresh water, cold water, even in air. And this is what can also be the basis of a lot of our new ways of doing things. And by now they have, I think, five factories in different areas, also in italy but also in other areas and always they they also adapt their whole systems to the local ecosystems local cultures and then make new hubs so you can scale a company like that but you have to do it in hubs another one is interface they went a different route they started about 25 years ago and they wanted to become um carbon neutral and in 2020, they achieved it. And now they say we go uh, carbon neg well, they go CO2 negative because they embrace carbon. They have learned so much in the past 25 years about designing. This is, for instance, the, the example of how to design 
a, a floor. It is, it's a flooring company. They design it with uh, like the floor of a forest, just so that they can use, normally you can reuse only, I don't know, 20% of the materials because the parts that have been walked over, you cannot reuse it in a new design. If you design like a forest floor, then you can reuse 95% of your materials again, and the rest you can use in um, a, a circular model. They have so many biomimicry things in their company. It's so inspiring. And it is a big company. It is a stock exchange company, um, really as inspiring in all kinds of ways. And then you have the other side, because we call it nature-based solutions. And the whole nonprofit world at this moment is writing about it. The United Nations, the World Bank, the European Commission, the World Wildlife Fund, they all write about nature-based solutions. And what are they? They are restoring ecosystems on the one hand, and they are creating benefits for the communities around it by creating food or creating other ways of income, creating economy. And also there you see it's, it's going from the other side, but it's really very interesting to see how this happens. That's also why I write about that restoring ecosystems is the first thing to do. Here you see, for instance, in, in Europe, Building with Nature works with lots of consortiums, with several consortiums on wetlands, wetlands in Europe and wetlands in, in Asia. I've seen them in Indonesia, where they are restoring mangrove forests and creating economies for local people. And also here in Europe, there's a lot going on with this restoring of ecosystems. You also see it with the weather makers. They have consortiums. Um, you see a big area in China, the Lus Plateau has been restored in 14 years time. An area the size of the Netherlands has been restored ecosystems and its food production and local economy for the people. So that they also preserve it because that's the other side. You can restore ecosystems, but if the community doesn't preserve it, you still have nothing. And at this moment, the weather makers are working on a project to really re-green a big part of the Sinai Desert in, the, in Egypt. And the calculations by the, by the scientists are that even the weather will change if this part is re-greened again. It's not an original desert. A desert can be an ecosystem, yes, and we have to preserve it as a desert, but this has been uh, in the past has been, it, it's, it's uh, desertified. So if they're going to, to really um, restore that, they will have, yeah, work, economy, food for all the local people and the weather in the area will change, less hurricanes, lots of these things will happen. And it's just by restoring it big scale, by dredging the lake that has the sediments in it that has been flowing through to the lake. Now they're dredging the lake and they are also replanting and doing stuff. Very interesting projects. And this was my talk. I hope you heard some new things. I hope you heard some inspiring things and I hope all of us in all in our own way can be inspired leaders by being firmly connected to nature, firmly connected to our own inner wisdom and firmly connected to others because only in collaboration with others and in this diversity of solutions will we find the solutions. Thank you. So many examples. It's really um, 
we, we I, th I think that those of us that are in the space, it's, it's sometimes hard for us to fathom how many projects are going on out there that we don't even know about. So I hadn't actually heard of any of these examples that you used. So I found that really amazing. Um, when you were on the slide that had all the green ovals, there was one question from Bert. He said, uh, recently I saw a World Economic Forum post on LI where they promoted a laser machine that kills weeds but keeps the crop intact and they even stated it was biosafe. What's your opinion on that? Yes, well, um, I must say some of this um, can be so... <sighs> Here we come with the super formula again, but maybe Johan can tell us something about that. But it is, it, if we go for the technology where you can really not send so many uh, figures, um, shapes over the internet, but really go for the dots and then make them locally again into shapes, that would really change a lot of the energy consumption of technology. That's one part. The other part, what I always see is we need to embrace flow because we want to store too much. Of course, the things is that um, we have to design with flow. We have to make sure, do we need to keep this or not? I do recognize in a lot of third world countries, for instance, if you do not have the systems in place to know who owns land or whatever, then you are really in a bad place if somebody in the government says, today you don't own it anymore. So then you have to have a storage and some bureaucracy of a kind. But we don't need to store everything. It's stupid that Facebook stores. Why would they store? Why? It's just that things can flow. And if you put flow into technology, all your designs will be different, all your uh, energy will be different, your energy consumptions will be different. I also think that a lot of energy things will also be solved if you have combinatorial innovation and you go for the local solutions with local grids, not go it over big grids, but local grids, and then also have very small scale things that will use small scale um, uh, energy consumption. There's always this example in blue economy where you use the energy of, um, of the, um, uh, the um, um, gravity. You can use gravity and then scientists say, well, you have to transport something up before it goes down again. But if you have pressure of a roof, on a building, then you can have this energy into your piezoelectronics. And then piezoelectronics, they tell me it needs, well, movement. Well, then you can build with bamboo and bamboo has a little movement because a lot of the buildings that need to be like hurric hurricane proof or, or um, um, when the ground shakes proof, uh, you have to build in a different way. And then you can use these kind of solutions as well. But then we have to go look completely different to these large scale things and make them local um, yeah, and different. And the same with materials. I must say some of this will solve like there is this, this movement now on batteries. They say that industrial hemp together with nanotechnology will be a very good um, alternative for lithium. Well, then you could have maybe batteries that really um, do it on locally grown materials that you don't need a lot of either. But then we also have to design the different business models. And that's where I really love Laurie and the whole group here, because we have to go to business models, maybe on memberships, maybe on other ways, maybe, I don't know. But the industrial era started with a business model for, um, uh, for this, this, 
this new industrial designs. If there wasn't a business model there then, it would never have taken off. And I think with the new things, I really love, like the Cine Desert Project, it has an, an older scientist who did a lot of work in the 1970s, came up with radical ideas, really radical. Nobody believed him. But now he's teaming up with young entrepreneurs who make a business model out of it. And then together they really do all these radical stuff in business models. Well, that's great. Just love it. Hmm. Anthony, I think you had a question or a comment. Uh, yes, thank you very much for sharing. You've, you've tackled a huge scope here in your, your talk, Desiree, so I commend you for that. Uh, um, I guess my question uh, is, is really about whether you know uh, about some, any research on the, on the question that I want to ask. Um, we, we know that if we took the Western lifestyle and tried to replicate that wor worldwide, we'd be at, I can't remember the exact number, is it five or six Earth's worth of materials? And um, we, we know that all of the techniques that you've been describing reduces that footprint. But I'm wondering, do you, are you aware of any research that's tried to do the integration of how much we have to um, degrowth versus how much we can take up um, or continue to do, but doing it in the new ways that you've been describing? Yeah. I must say it's a very good question because I have this discussion with people a lot. And I think, yes, we need to degrowth in the Western world. Personally, I've made my life rather simple and I really see that with a lot of entrepreneurs, they make their life simple just because also it is easier to be a radical entrepreneur if you make your life more simple and more cheap so you can really be more radical in what you do and not sell your soul for money all the time. Mm -hmm. So I see the radical entrepreneurs doing a lot of work there. Um, I also see that a lot of the younger generation and that really, um, yeah, a, a lot of the young people around me don't care so much for ownership, for instance. And then you see a lot of the sharing economy coming in. You see a lot of those things coming in as well. And maybe all these things together will find it out. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have the, uh, your question was, do I have like the details how much we need to degrowth? I don't, but I do know there is a lot of work done about degrowth I have to look up his name there have been some some really the people who are also working on the commons and the degrowth and everything they have been working a lot on this I must say I for me it's always e better to inspire also with lots of other examples and then ask the question what are you going to do in your next step and then some will come up with a great technology solution that uses little resource, for instance. And another will come up with maybe making their life really simple. Um, and then I see that the things that I'm talking about are easily um, embraced in the third world where they may be, um, yeah, change a step. Or for instance, at this moment, I see that a lot of it is embraced in China. It, it sounds crazy, but they have this regulation in 2015, they have declared that they want to become an ecological economy. And they do have, of course, their ways of doing it because they just say, okay, we do it. So we do it and take up your shovel and just restore ecosystems or, and things like that. And they will also find ways. I'm, I'm not in the judgment way. I just do what feels right for me. And that's making my life simple for the whole thing. But I will not judge others if they go other ways. If, if you do uh, come across any um, research on, on this question uh, then please share it with the group in, in the in the LinkedIn group that will be very yeah. interesting uh, 
background information. Thank you. I, I will ask my, there are people in my network who, who, will, who will know at least how far they are with the research on that, yes. So I will, I will ask them and uh, I will let you know. Any other questions, uh, comments? I'm very appreciative of the 50,000 foot view. I mean, uh, typically entrepreneurs tend to be in the thick of it. And, you know, Anthony and maybe somebody like Bob and a couple other people on this call are, you know, uh, sort of ahead of the curve uh, on, on most things and, and thinking a little bit higher level. But that little pinpoint that you had in your circle diagram for me is quite um, um, in some ways alarming that I don't, I don't think in that way. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking in a lot of details and I'm thinking in a lot of action and not so much in, the, in that space that you're in. So I really appreciate the conversation. All right, if there's no further questions, then I oh. am, oh, go ahead, oh. sorry. Oh, it's Peter. Hi, I'll, I'll, I could add, ask one. I was curious about, uh, Desiree, I, I really appreciated the talk and thank you for, for joining us, time zones and all. I was interested in uh, what type of um, collaboration or um, alliance models that you, you, you see you see used or that you would like to, that you like to use as a coordinator you know, are you familiar with the quadruple helix with the integration of of um, you know of, of business nonprofit government and academic uh, groups working together have you you know what what type of uh, collaboration arrangements and and types of uh, coordination um, uh, of groups to, uh, do you see working well in the regenerative projects? Yeah, I must say here the social skills really come in because there's lots of language problems there. And I don't mean language problems as one speaks English and the other Chinese. I really mean like they speak a different language. It's like the scientists really speak different languages. If I look at systemic thinking, then there's lots of things about feedback loops and making, and then lots of people think, oh yeah, but what do I need to do? And it gets too complex and ah, oh, this is too complicated. I cannot do that. Or, and then the business people, they have this chop chop mentality. Okay, now let's do this and not talk too long about it. Let's just do it. It's like, yeah, we make a decision and then we just do it. And then governments, they are more like, have bureaucratic, somebody else needs to really think about that and we need to have this whole, and these are different ways of, of thinking and different ways of collaborating, which makes it difficult in, a, in consortiums, for instance, I saw it very much in Indonesia where um, there is this, business people, these dredging people coming from dredging firms saying, okay, this is the engineering you can use. And then there's scientists and educators, and then there's governments, and then there's local people, communities, and they all have to do this together. And then you need the glue. And that's why I really uh, think that a lot of the education should also go to the um, the deep generalists, I sometimes call them, or the um, holy math, I don't know. They understand a little of everything, but they are also able to be the glue and just be with this group because they want to be heard and then be with that group and then really translate how it comes to something. I, I uh, just want to uh, mention... Uh, Peter and I, and I think a few other people on the call uh, tonight were on a call yesterday evening of the Systems Thinking Ontario uh, group. And the topic was socio-technical systems thinking. And part of the conversation at least was about um, the fact that we actually do have the social technologies um, and we've had them for quite a long time to do exactly what you've just said, Desiree, but they're just not well known and well practiced. Um, and uh, Peter, I don't know if the meeting came to any conclusions on this topic. I, I unfortunately had to leave part of the way through, but uh, it was a very, very good reminder that we do have the social technologies to do this work very um, gracefully. Um, yeah. 
but we don't use them. I think it's very important that everybody realizes that these social technologies are there and that they're being used. Yeah, yeah. Because then it comes to the social skills. So Josh has put in the chat, I don't know the Euro regulatory environment, but wonder how widely replicable the lever pays it forward system is. Have you seen it elsewhere, Desiree? And thanks for the talk. <laughs> Lever pays it forward. Is it more like, I'm not sure what you mean. Can you elaborate on it, Josh? Sure, as in the um, company that abandons the project, abandons the site. Um, I think you said the Italian government uh, was giving them a huge bill. And so they yeah. were, um, I can't think of the word, but incentivized to um, work with uh, Novamont is what yeah. it sounded like. I'm not, I'm not sure. It depends, of course, how much the governments also realize that they are in this flawed system where they just, um, they have given themselves the role to first subsidize everything then allow, then allow businesses to make this money private again. And then they have to clean up the mess. Well, that's stupid for governments. So only the governments who really realize that this is happening and that they are able to change it will maybe do this kind of of things and also maybe because it's an island and it was a big a huge job creator so the island would be really lost without this this um this company creating jobs and that's where the island government said well you cannot just leave it's not like you have used us and now you just leave that's not that's not gonna happen you have to pay for that and then it was more cheap to give the whole plan to Nova Mont and even give them startup money and everything so that they could preserve the jobs, making it a biorefinery, whereas it was an oil refinery. Uh, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for so that. If, yeah, it depends a lot on how governments realize this. Perfect. I feel like there's such a, um, the, the race to the bottom that Janet Yellen was uh, speaking on a couple of weeks ago, I think is, you know, prevents um, other jurisdictions from, from doing what happened here in Sardinia. But uh, so yeah. I'm curious about that. All right, thanks. Yes, yeah, some governments really take a more radical view. Like I see New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern is really doing great work on that. Uh, but of course, it's smaller. Islands are smaller. They're more, yeah, it's much more easier maybe to do it like that. In Holland, I also don't see this. I, I see a lot of governments not even understanding completely what I say if I would give a talk like this. I, I had the other day a, a talk with a, a, an alderman who was rather a systemic thinker. And he said to me, how do I explain to the people that they need these windmills and I say well you, you can't sorry if somebody is not busy with windmills because they have to feed their children and they're just all this time running around to have a job and, and pay their their rent and whatever they're not caring about your windmills you have to make a long-term vision otherwise you can never get a communication across and then he doesn't want to hear that. So I don't know. So I'm going to wrap it there. We're getting uh, up to our, our, our time. And yeah. uh, so if you can see on the screen, you, as and anyone who's already a member of the group, you'll know that we post uh, everything to the original posting in LinkedIn. So you'll get a notification of that, hopefully, if your notifications are set correctly. But you can always go to the wiki and the... Um, and the drive to see the information and I'm posting all the videos on YouTube now so they're a little bit easier to find.
Um, before we head out, our next talk is going to be um, by C.V. Harquill, and she's going to be um, talking about why advocates of the flourishing business should be thinking about feminism. And so that ties into the last uh, um, session that we had recently with P.K. Much talking all about the feminist business model. Um, but I think there's going to be some very interesting things that are going to be part of this discussion. So I encourage everybody to attend, spread the word. I will be posting this on LinkedIn um, later this week. So please share it out widely and vastly. Um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate that we knew everyone's taken the time out of their busy days to part participate in the things that we're interested in because of the things that you're interested in. Uh, and we're growing quite rapidly between 30 and 50 people a month, which is a lot. And so hopefully these uh, meetings will be um, better attended, pretty well attended now. Um, but if you know of any um, topics that people are looking to speak or we're looking for people to, to speak, and if you think that there's somebody that this group would be interested in, please let me know or introduce me because uh, we will be really working towards um, uh, all of our speakers. We're actually booked out all the way till November of this year and now scheduling into January. So if someone says they're too busy now, tell them to don't worry. We'll be booking them into the new year. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And we will see you at the next meeting, which will be um, June 8th with C.V. Harquell. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you very much, all of you. And thanks, Laurie, for the invitation. My pleasure. Thank you. See you on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.